Welcome back. I would like to introduce our next presenter, Mattia Quattroselli. He is the newest member of the Heart Institute's research core team, and he conducts research that aims to improve treatments of heart and muscle conditions through novel mechanisms and translational strategies. His conditions through novel mechanism, or I'm sorry, his laboratory research focuses on the molecular aspects regulating physiology and pharmacology of cardiac and skeletal muscles. He is interested in exploring how transcriptional, epigenetic, and me metabolic mechanisms converge in remodeling tissue function in development, disease, and recovery. He earned his master's degree in experimental and applied biology at the University of Pavia in Italy, and he completed his PhD in biomedical sciences at Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Later, he earned a second postdoctoral fellowship from the MDA in glucocorticoids and dystrophic, dystrophic sorry, muscle repair mechanisms at Northwestern University in Chicago. Mattia, that is a lot of words there. I apologize. I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. Does it work? Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Nicole, and thank you for the MD, uh, to the MDA for giving me the uh, possibility of presenting this to, to you today. I'm Mattia from Cincinnati Children's. I'm here starting my own lab. Uh, and I will talk to you a little about what is going on with research and clinical trials in uh, Duchenne and other muscular dystrophies. Um, first, uh, a, a brief note on the fact that uh, I'm a biologist, uh, I'm uh, in research, um, and, oh, can you still see the slide? No, we switched. Can you share your screen again? I'm sorry. There you go. That's okay. So. Um, I'm a biologist. I do. I conduct research on muscle, and while studying uh, how you know how to make muscle move, how to make it uh, move better, I actually moved quite a bit myself. Uh, I was born in, in the center of Italy. I moved to the north of Italy for my undergrad. I moved to Belgium for my um, grad school, and then after that, I moved to. Uh, to Chicago, to Northwestern for my postdoc, and now I moved to Cincinnati, where I'm setting up my lab. Um, the, uh, the overall ba backdrop of today's presentations and today's event uh, is, the, <coughs> is the fact that the MDA is a really powerful engine uh, bringing together patients, doctors, biologists, um, uh, big pharma, small pharma, and so on, all together, in order to uh, provide um, answers, uh, possibilities, um, access to, to, to trials, access to knowledge, and so on, not only regarding Duchenne muscular dystrophies, but also all the other neuromuscular disorders. And from a research perspective, it is important to consider the fact that um, the concepts and the ideas that are worth pursuing for Duchenne might actually be of interest for other neuromuscular disorders and vice versa. Um, indeed, research in, uh, if I think about research in muscular dystrophies and neuromuscular disorders, I think about these mental process. Uh, uh, first, uh, questions about the muscle biology and how the rest of the body responds to problems and solutions uh, with, muscle, uh, with muscle biology how to test these hypotheses in animal models in order to see what works or what doesn't work and how does it work in vivo in a living organism. And this also gets hopefully translated into clinical trials with new drugs or with new methods or with different ways of treating old drugs. Um, Nowadays, it's, uh, uh, it's a pretty exciting time for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophies and neuromuscular disorders, as a lot of clinical trials are now active, actively recruiting and so on, in at least three possible uh, and very promising um, avenues, therapeutic avenues. Uh, axon skipping, gene therapies, and uh, novel ways of treating uh, uh, pathology and inflammation with steroids and other molecules. Um, at present, uh, there are at least uh, 84 active studies um, and uh, pretty much scattered all, all over the world, uh, mainly, of course, United States, uh, Canada, and Europe. Um, and uh, 
I will present some of these studies now, uh, and especially with regards to the different concepts that are exploited for uh, addressing a therapeutic uh, uh, effect. Uh, I want to make clear that I'm a biologist. I do research, I do basic research into mechanism and how this mechanism can be used in principle to do <clears throat> To arrive to a, uh, to uh, a therapeutic uh, uh, opportunity, uh, I'm not endorsing any of these studies, um, and I'm just reporting them for uh, um, completion of information and as examples of what goes on in the field nowadays. Um, so the first uh, the first therapeutic theme, let's say that we're gonna that we're gonna review today is the idea of axon skipping. If you have a mutation in one of the blocks that constitute the gene of the strophin, for instance, which are called axons, uh, the idea is that there is the possibility of basically bypassing the mutated, the problematic block with some small pieces of DNA that will allow the cells, specifically the muscle cells, to codify a slightly shorter version Personal, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to retain a bit of function and it's going to hopefully improve overall function of the whole muscle. Uh, in, uh, this is definitely one of the um, most uh, advanced therapeutic concepts that is, however, now already clinical reality. There are two products which are FDA approved now, um, which have very, very complicated names. I don't, I don't understand why they cannot find a, a simpler name. But anyway, um, these, these drugs are for skipping exon 51, if you have a deletion in exon 51, or exon 53, if you have a deletion there. Um, the data seem, uh, uh, the data reported by the company, uh, Sarepta, who's commercializing this product, seem pretty uh, promising. Um, uh, in, uh, in data that they recently reported, uh, a study with uh, 180 weeks, so that's uh, um, almost basically three years of dosing, reported that, it, that there is almost a 1% dystrophy in production, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, it's not a lot, but it's encouraging. And uh, uh, also, I want to make uh, sure that the same company, I want to make sure to mention that the same company uh, has uh, submitted an FDA application for another uh, for another oligonucleotide to target mutations in exon 45. On top of that, there are many more active studies in exon skipping with other oligonucleotides, other companies, other products. Um, and uh, there are, uh, as I sh shortly listed here, at least 12 active studies. And I want to bring to attention two, uh, which I think are of interest. Uh, one, um, is uh, uh, basically another drug from another company, uh, and uh, um, they are uh, addressing it in ambulant boys with DMD, and this is uh, another uh, drug to skip exon 53. Um, and another study that I find interesting is a, a study that is going on at National Wide Children's together with Sarepta uh, that is testing the efficacy and safety of the three drugs in combination or in, in a test of one versus each other, which is interesting because with these drugs now approaching clinical reality, it is important to, uh, to see which one, I mean, to test them side, side to side and in possible combinations. In, in case this is applicable, applicable in order to see uh, what works best, what works less in, com in comparison between each other. Uh, the other important therapeutic avenue that is really intensively investigated now, and it is progressing to a clinical reality with the first clinical trials and so on, is gene therapy. And if you will, this is the, um, the, the one of the most important, one of the most advanced uh, um, ideas, therapeutic ideas in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other neuromuscular diseases. Considering that all these diseases are hereditary genetic diseases, the idea is why don't we address the causal problem that is the mutated gene? What can we do about it? On top of that, there is also a, a technical uh, aspect of this, that is the usage of viral vectors in order to uh, carry the, um, the novel genetic or the therapeutic genetic material uh, all around the body and possibly all around the heart and skeletal muscle cells all over the body, at least ideally. Uh, at present, there are three main ideas used with gene therapy, uh, for gene therapy that would be for viral vectors. Um, and there is viral vectors for a more stable version of exoskeeping, uh, viral vectors for reintroducing dystrophin as a shortened version, 
the, you will probably hear about uh, this in terms of micro dystrophin or mini dystrophin. These are shortened version of dystrophin, which however carry a sizable amount of function with them. And uh, the most uh, uh, advanced uh, and yet uh, sti that, that still has to be tried in clinical trials, um, gene therapy is the possibility of editing the endogenous mutated dystrophin gene uh, with the usage of CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, uh, um, this strategy is still in uh, preclinical animal models. It shows a lot of promise, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the first clinical trial will probably uh, arrive in the first years to come. But at present, uh, I'm, I want to point out that this strategy is still the most, uh, um, is still uh, related to preclinical testing. Um, with regards to gene therapy, there are a number of uh, trials that have just been completed or they are still active. Um, there is the seminal one with uh, mini dystrophin at National White Children's. Uh, there is an, another important one with the micro dystrophin uh, as intramuscular gene transfer. Uh, there is the active clinical trial with the Pfizer uh, drug or the Pfizer viral vector, uh, which also carries a shortened version of dystrophin. Um, and then uh, I wanted to bring to, uh, I wanted to review also and uh, to bring to attention this trial at Nationwide uh, with gene therapy and delivery of uh, this gene, uh, again, a very complicated name, GALGT2, um, which is called the surrogate gene therapy. And, it's, uh, and it follows this intriguing concept of actually supplying the dystrophic muscle with this gene to uh, basically uh, regardless of the mutation, regardless of the specific mutation the, the, muscle, the muscle carries and the patient carries, to try to make the muscle better, um, again, regardless of the mutation. Um, I want to make sure to mention the current standing challenges with AAV. I've already seen a lot of questions pointing in that direction, and it is important to address this because these are real challenges presently and currently uh, true, and because there is an intense investigation in this area. So be ready to expect something coming on in these areas in the next uh, two, three years, I would say. Um, on one side, the problem of immunotolerance. Uh, uh, give or take a fourth or a third of the population is, uh, has innate immunity to the viral vectors um, that are needed for the gene therapy. And on top of that, once you receive the first dosing of the drug, of the gene, of the gene uh, therapy, of the, uh, the viral vector load, uh, you acquire immunity. And uh, you cannot, in principle, at least at present, with what we know and the tools that we have in the clinics, you cannot be redosed again. Uh, so that's why there is a lot of, uh, there's really a lot of intense uh, investigation into this area in order to see how you can basically bypass this acquired or innate immunity so that you can be dosed the first time and possibly a second time in order to extend the efficacy of the drugs and of the delivery of the therapeutic gene material. Um, and also at the same time, uh, I want to mention the fact that there is a very intense uh, investigation into uh, viral free systems using for instance nanoparticles or cells in order to deliver um, to deliver the therapeutic gene material and at the same time uh, bypass the immunity. Um, and then um, I want to uh, talk for the last five ten minutes about disease management, uh, steroids uh, and novel perspective in that. Um, so steroids are for instance uh, used at present to manage pathology and to decrease inflammation. Um, and uh, thanks to the steroid usage, uh, thanks to the uh, nighttime ventilation, thanks to, for instance, the all the, let's say, uh, wonderful advancements uh, with integrative care um, in uh, DMD pathology management, we are now um, in front of uh, an important uh, advancement that is an increased life expectancy for, uh, for Duchenne patients, but at the same time, we have to consider the fact that the remittance from the current therapies will not be, uh, will not be complete. In other words, even with, the, with gene therapies, even with action skipping, we will still have a lot of pathology to manage and we will have to manage it in the long term, actually in a longer term than what we used to, to think about in the past. And so uh, it is important to consider this and to consider this with regards to the steroid and steroid usage. 
because again, it is true that they are, uh, they are important and incredibly beneficial in managing muscle inflammation and, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, um, uh, elongating the ambulatory period. However, at the same time, they come with a hefty price of side effects with regards to growth suppression, osteoporosis, obesity, and metabolic syndrome, and so on. Um, so to address this, what is, uh, what is the research uh, at present? So one possible avenue is basically new drugs, new steroids. And uh, the moral one, BPP-15, is for instance a very uh, promising example in this. The moron is a uh, novel type of steroid, uh, which uh, basically aims at decreasing the side effect and still maintaining benefits with a different way through which the drug activates the uh, receptor of the drug. And uh, the first clinical trials are ongoing and I've published some interim results, which are very promising. As you can see from the green and the yellow uh, curves here, uh, the uh, high uh, or the highest uh, doses groups are presenting uh, some uh, at least initial uh, gains in strength and, uh, um, uh, and uh, overall, I would say, muscle function. Uh, an active study conducted by Revragen is now ongoing to assess efficacy and safety of Morolon in uh, Duchenne. Uh, and this study is going to be particularly interesting because in this study, uh, an arm, uh, a comparatory uh, arm, will also be included with the present steroids. In order to start asking the question of whether Morolon is better or, uh, or the same or better as compared to the traditional steroids used. Um, uh, among the synthetic uh, normal traditional glucocorticoids, the flazocort is emerging as the as uh, is emerging as the better one. In on one side, um, uh, let's say um, promoting benefits and at the same time uh, reducing side effects. These are uh, um, data that have been published by PTC Therapeutics uh, and uh, that I. Uh, that I have accessed uh, actually this morning uh, by PTC Therapeutics and a number of investigators from a number of, of universities in the United States. And as you can see, uh, comparing the flazacort to prednisone and prednisolone treated patients, it looks like uh, um, the, flazacort, uh, the flazacort introduces a modest but significant improvement in a muscle function evaluated as a six minutes walk test and four step descent test among the others. Um, PTC Therapeutics uh, is conducting a, uh, a clinical study uh, in, uh, in, uh, in participants with other uh, Duchenne muscle dystrophy, such as Lindbergh muscle dystrophy, which again uh, um, brings up the question of how much we can uh, extend the uh, steroid therapies to not only Duchenne, but also other types of neuromuscular disorders. And, uh, uh, and I will use a minute or two to uh, bring up the work that we have performing in the past uh, uh, two, three years, I would say, um, with the uh, possibility of uh, uh, ameliorating the efficacy of uh, steroid dosing in uh, Duchenne and other muscular dystrophies by revising the frequency of intake from daily to pulsatile intermittent in intake, which was originally proposed by Dr. Connolly's group uh, as high dose weekend uh, intake. Um, and what we have published uh, uh, eight months ago, uh, what we found in uh, dystrophic mice, and also we had the fortune of, uh, uh, of investigating some uh, uh, very small cohort of clinical data and serum samples from uh, uh, patients with Duchenne muscle dystrophy, was that with, with intermittent dosing, we actually leverage a very striking metabolic response of the dystrophic muscle in order to reduce the metabolic side effects as compared to daily dosing of intake or daily intake of glucocorticoid steroids. And indeed, in uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, comparing uh, with Duchenne patients on daily versus weekend steroids uh, in uh, comparable conditions of age, body mass index, and treatment duration, we were able to see that uh, the patients on weekend steroids were showing a lower fat mass and, uh, and intriguingly a, uh, an increased lean mass as compared to the patients on daily steroids. Um, and this correlated with reduction of markers of metabolic stress such as brain chain amino acids, glucose and insulin in serum. Um, and uh, a study is now uh, ongoing at Northwestern University, uh, is, uh, phase two, um, is active now uh, to, uh, to see whether the uh, weekly intermittent steroids are actually applicable and safe in, uh, um, in other conditions of muscular dystrophy, such as Becker or Lindbergh or muscular dystrophy. Um, there's a study now at University of Florida 
now investigating whether uh, meat and steroids uh, in combination with exercise are uh, of therapeutic relevance for Duchenne. Um, and uh, I wanted to, uh, to bring uh, to attention another study, which is active and nationwide, uh, and in combination with the MDA, evaluating whether uh, uh, glucocorticoid steroids and MR antagonist, uh, mineralocorticoid antagonist, these are a different class of steroids, uh, are, uh, are of therapeutic benefit in Duchenne, especially in, uh, in a comparative study. And this is going to be very important to address for immediate applications. Uh, so, as a summary, as a wrap, I want to say that research in uh, Duchenne and other muscle dystrophy is very alive and kicking, as we would say, um, and uh, it is still relying on the uh, tight integration between uh, biology, genetics, pharmacology, and uh, every possible therapeutic advancement that we can bring in order to, um, uh, to help and uh, uh, improve uh, care and I would say integrated care using the words of Dr. Wong before me for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, I, with that, I will uh, stop my uh, screen sharing and uh, I will take questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few questions that have come in. What is the estimate for trials in, the, in this domain to ensure full-length dystrophin expression? This could be effective for families like us who are affected with longer deletions. Uh, this, is a, this is a great question. And unfortunately, it's a question that uh, I, we don't really have an answer for. We will have an answer with the first, uh, when the first data of the first trials will be on. Um, I really cannot make a prediction. I would say that it's going to be longer than, for instance, the exon skipping trials or uh, drug trials, because net, because in the nature of uh, the of the therapeutic avenue itself, you have to restore a whole gene and you have to restore it uh, in as many cells as you can, and uh, you have to uh, then allow the muscle to express it, and, and you have to, uh, to have you have to allow the muscle pathology to adapt to that. So I guess that it's gonna be longer than what we normally are used to with the exon skipping or drug trials, but we will have an answer for that with the first results of the first trials. Okay. What cases are eligible for gene therapy? Um, depends, on, uh, depends on what the gene therapy is carrying. If the gene therapy is carrying exon skipping, then uh, you have to check which mutations you have and whether the mutation is amenable to the exon skipping oligonucleotide that the virus will, will, that the viral vector is bringing. Um, whereas the, um, if uh, we're talking about the CRISPR-Cas9 based uh, viral vectors, that is also that is also going to be probably mutation specific because the um, let's say the the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, tools that are needed to repair the gene in the body are going to be, especially the first one, most likely mutation specific. What, if we're talking about um, the gene therapy for replacement of the whole dystrophin with mini or micro dystrophin, in principle, and that's the beauty of that therapeutic approach, in principle, those approaches are uh, for virtually for uh, uh, mutation insensitive. They are virtually for everyone with uh, for every dystrophic uh, patient, or at least for every dystrophic patient with a mutation in dystrophy. Uh, that said, again, I want to make a clear point that we don't know that. This is, this is an hypothesis, but we still don't know that. So the first trials will actually also tell us whether, for instance, patients with different mutations will respond, will respond the same or differently. Okay. Please advise on what is available for duplication errors. Dr. Steve Wilton's lab sold skipping drug to Sarepta. One of Dr. Wilton's researchers has developed a compound to knock out duplication. Um, can you tell, can you elaborate on that at all? That is, uh, that is a very, that's a very specific and yet a very fascinating question because the genetics and the biology behind duplications uh, as, as well as large deletion is still somehow unresolved. Mm -hmm. um, and those, uh, present uh, unique challenges to the therapeutics and to the therapeutics, uh, therapeutic opportunities that we are investigating at present. In, um, in principle, yes, what I was aware of is that in principle, the exon skipping should be uh, possible, again, at least in principle for duplication, although the uh, strategy will have to be somehow um, specifically targeted and tailored for that because the, um, let's say the part of the gene that you want to skip is bigger, is larger, and that's a challenge. Um, in principle, uh, 
ra rational wise, the duplication should be amenable for mini or macrodystrophin, but we won't know that until the first uh, clinical trials are, 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 are around. So yes, it's, uh, it's still up in, the, the question is still a little up in the air, but I suppose that the, uh, the current advancement, the current present day advancement mm -hmm. with both uh, uh, microdystrophin and exon skipping will, will provide some answers at least. Okay, and uh, the last question we could take, when there is so much data favoring intermittent dosing of steroids, why does the eligibility criteria for all DMD gene therapy and gene editing trials ask kids to be on daily steroid dosage? Um, this is, a, this is a, an important question, and uh, it's a question that I would like to turn to the neurologist, first of all. Uh, it's, okay. um, so, and this is an, an important advice, an important disclosure from me to all the patients and all the patient families. As Dr. Wang was saying, always refer to the neurologist. Always refer to the neurologist uh, who is treating uh, you or is treating your, uh, the patient in your family. This is important because the, your, your neurologist, the neurologist that you're seeing, Mm -hmm. is the one who knows you best and who knows what is best. Now, what I can say is that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of evidence is favoring uh, toward intermittent dosing. However, there is still no clear consensus. And also, let's not confuse what is needed for different stages of disease. For instance, if uh, for, gene, uh, for gene therapies and for viral vector delivery, uh, you need an important initial bolus of immune suppression in order to have the viral, the, the big viral dose, right? So, and, and during that initial period, probably you will be on daily steroids and probably daily steroids will always be recommended for that initial period because you need a lower level, or I would say a higher level of immune suppression or immune, okay. let's say immune modulation. So that's for that. For pathology management, then we can uh, discuss about whether uh, whether intermittent or daily dosing will, will have to be probably tailored to different stages and different ages uh, in, in your life. But that's, uh, that's a question that is better addressed to the neurologist who's seen you, who's treating you, and who knows your story. That's a great explanation. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was very informative and um, for very in interesting. Sure. So thank you so much. And up next, uh, we are going to take a quick break and be back at a quarter till to begin our drug development roundtable discussion. So stay with us. Thank you. <laughs>